I welcome to Mathematics uh, class. My name is Olatubosu Ogutunde. And uh, our last class, where we discussed uh, inverse variation, I gave you two assignments to work on. And I believe by now, you're supposed to have done the assignment. And I promise in our last class that I'm going to provide solution to the assignment. And before we go further, I mean, before we start uh, today's uh, topic, I would like to provide solution to the assignment I gave in our last class. And the first question says that if V varies inversely as square root of H, A, find the formula connecting V and H. And be part of that question says, find H when V equal to 1 whole number 3 over 5. And from what I have here, when you write out the expression for that uh, variation, you will see that V equal to K over square root of H, where K is a constant. And when you substitute all the values that we are given, I mean, when we substitute 5 for V and 64 for H, at the end of everything, we discover that our constant is equal to 40. Our constant is equal to 40. Then I told you to find the formula connecting V and H. What we need to do is to substitute the value of K into the final equation, which is V equal to K over square root of H. And by doing that, the formula connecting V and H is V equal to 40 over what? Square root of H. That is the solution to a part of that question. And B, we are looking for H when V equal to one whole number, three over five. And I told you that any question that you want to solve, we are going to start from the formula connecting these particular variables. And when you substitute for, for V in that formula, the first thing to do is to change the mixed fraction to improper fraction. So when you change one whole number, three over five to improper fraction, that will give us eight over what? Over five. So when you substitute everything into that formula, we discover that our age is equal to 625. Our age is equal to 625. So that is the solution to question one. Then let's quickly look at the question two. And that question two, we are given a, a table. And that table has a two rows. Then we have row for P, and then we have row for Q. And it has a six columns. And the first column, we are given 32 for P, and we are given two for Q. And for P, we also have 40, 60, 64 and 100 and uh, we were told to find q when p equal to 40 when p equal to 60 when p equal to 64 and when p equal to 100 and we are given an expression and that expression says p varies directly as cube of q p varies directly as cube of Q. And how can we get the formula connecting them? Then you now go back to the first column of that table where we have P to be equal to 32 and Q to be equal to what? To be equal to 2. Then substitute those values into the formula, con into the formula that is the equation of that expression, which is a P equal to K Q cube. So when you substitute 32 for P, 
and 2 for Q, you will discover that the constant K is equal to K. Constant K is equal to K. And from there, we can now find the formula connected P and Q. And that formula now is P equal to 4 Q cube. And any other thing that you want to do to find Q when P equal to 40, when P equal to 60, when P equal to 64, and when P equal to 100. Then we are going to base on this formula. And from what I have with me here, the solution to that table is when P equal to 40, Q equal to 2.15. And when P equal to 60, Q equal to 2.47. And when P equal to 64, Q equal to 2.52. And when P equal to 100, Q equal to 2.92. And from this, don't forget that you are given a condition there that make sure that you correct your answer to three significant figures. That is why we put all the answers in three figures. And I believe with this, uh, the problem is solved already, and I believe you got the right answer. So now let's go quickly go to what we have today. And today, we are going to look at the third type of variation. I gave you four types, direct, inverse, joint, and partial variation. We have discussed direct, we have discussed inverse, and today we are going to look at uh, joint variation. And by the end of today's uh, lesson, you should be able to explain joint variation and also you should be able to solve problems involving joint variation. And what is joint variation? This type of variation involves three or more variables. This type of variation involves three or more variables. And these variables, they can join together by direct, inverse, or both. So the three variables can what? Can join together either by direct variation, inverse variation, or both. Now, let's look at what we have here. For instance, if P varies directly as Q and inversely as R, so we have three variables there. We have P, we have Q, and then we have what? We have R. And when you look at the P and Q, the type of variation between them is what? Is direct. That is, P varies directly as what? As Q. And this same P varies inversely as R. So I get to write another sign of what? Proportionality. And don't forget that we are talking of inverse. The inverse means what? One over whatever variable we are, we are talking about. So I get to have one over what? Over R. So P directly with what? Dire has direct relationship with what? With Q. And inverse relationship with R. And what are we going to do? So we need only one sign of proportionality. So that one is what? The first one, you keep it. And then you move to the second one. So this second one now turns to what? Multiplication. So I get to multiply this together. So I get to have P varies directly as Q times 1. That will give us Q. Then over what? Over R. And don't forget in our previous classes, that I told you what to do next. Then the next thing to do is to think this sign to what? To equal to. Then how can you do that? Then you need to introduce a constant. So that constant now is P equal to K Q over what? Over R. So you can see from here that we have three variables. We have P, we have Q, and then we have what? We have R. 
And these variables, they are what? They are connected to one another by this constant k. And let's look at the examples. So we have uh, example one. P varies directly as Q and inversely as the square of R. And Q equal to 40 when R equal to 30 and P equal to 2 over 5. And from this question, we have three variables. We have P, we have what? We have Q, and then the last one is what? Is R. When you look at the first one, the type of variation between P and Q is what? Is direct. So we have direct variation. And between P and R is what? Is inverse. So we have 1 over what? 1 over R. And they, we have something there. Square of R. So I'm going to put square here. And don't forget what we just did. That we keep this sign... Then we turn, to, we turn this one to what? Multiplication. So Q will multiply 1. So I get to have P direct Q over what? Over R squared. Then the next thing is to change this to what? Equal to by introducing the constant K. So we have P now equal to KQ over what? Over R squared. And when you look at that question, we have Q. To be equal to 40, so our Q is given as what? 40. Then our R is given as 30. Then our P is given as what? 2 over 5. And these three values is what we are going to use to get our constant K. Then let's substitute and let's see what will be the value of K. So if you substitute, what is our P? 2 over 5. We have 2 over 5 equal to, what is our Q? Our Q is what? Is 40. That is 40K. Then over what? R. What is our R? That is 30. And please don't forget the square. That is a 30 square. Then we move further. So we have a 2 over 5 equal to what? That is a 40K. Then expand this. That is a 30 multiplied by 30. That will give us 900. Then we have to fraction. Right-hand side and left-hand side. What's the next thing to do? Then we cross-multiply. So when we cross-multiply, we are going to have 5 multiplied by 40. That will give us 200K. Then 2 multiplied by 900. That will give us 1,800. Then to get our K, we need to eliminate the coefficient. What's the coefficient there? That is 200. So it means we are going to divide both sides by 200. So when we divide this by 200, we divide this by what? By 200. So this cancel this. Then we have this cancel this. Then we have 2 year 1, 2 year what? 9. So it means our k now equal to what? Equal to 9. So our k equal to Nine. And when we look at that question, the first part of that question says, find the formula connecting the variables. Find the formula connecting the variables. Then to write the formula, you know we have the equation, which is P equal to KQ over what? Over R squared. So that is the equation of that uh, variation. Now, to find the formula, what we need to do is to substitute 9 for k. So that will give us the formula connecting the three variables together. So I'm going to have p now equal to 9q over what? Over r squared. So this is the formula connecting p, q, and r together. And b part of that question says, find r when q, we are looking for r, when q equal to 8, and when p equal to 2. So any, the next thing to do is to get r 
from this formula. Then what are we going to do? We substitute. So this is the B part. So let's substitute to get our R. What is P? P equal to 2. We write 2. What is our Q? Our Q is our Q is 8. So we have a 9 multiplied by 8. Everything over what? Over R square. Now, when you look at this, so we have 9 times 8. That will give us 50. Uh, that is 72. So we have 2 over 1 equal to 72 over what? Over R square. Then we cross multiply. So when we cross multiply, so we're going to have 2, we multiply R square. We have 2 R square equal to what? Equal to 72. Then the next thing to divide both sides by 2. Divide both sides by 2. This cancel this. Then we have R square to be equal to what? To be equal to 36. It is not R square that you are looking for. What? Okay? It is R. Then how can we get R from R square? So it may again to take square root of both sides. When we take square root of both sides, so this one will give us what? R, then square root of 36. So one square root of 36, that is same number. If you multiply it twice, it will give us 36. What is that number? 6, correct. So R now equal to 6. So it means that when Q equal to 8 and P equal to 2, according to this formula, our R is equal to 6. So I believe that is clear enough. So now, let's look at the second example. X varies inversely as Y. That is, X varies inversely. That is 1 over Y. And Z varies directly as X squared. So we have uh, Z varies directly as what? As X squared. Now, A says, express Z in terms of Y. If Z equal to 5, when y equal to 8. One thing I want us to look at in that question is, they are looking for relation between z and y. But if you look at this expression, z has relation with only x. And when you look at this expression, x has relation with y at the same time with what? With z. So what I'm going to do now is this. You are going to look for how to change x squared to what? Y. Then how can we change x squared to y? So now come to this place. Let's start with x. If you want to get x squared, it means the square this place to arrive at this. So when you square x, it means this new operation, you must carry that operation to what? To 1 over y. So it, it makes x squared varies inversely as what? 1 over y, everything raised to power 2. We want to change x squared to y. We don't need x here. According to that question, it says express z in terms of y, not in terms of x. So now, when we expand this, we are going to have what? 1 over y squared. 1 square, 1. y square, that is uh, y square. So now you cannot change this. x square to what? To 1 over y square. So again, to have z now varies as 1 over what? y square. So from this place, what are you going to do? Then you now change uh, this by multiply by what? K, Y, square. And from this place, we are given Z 
to be equal to 5, and y to be equal to 8. Then let's substitute. So we have, that is 5 equal to k over what? 8 squared. What is 8 squared? That is a 64. So we have 5 over 1 equal to k over what? Over 64. So when you multiply that, then our k now equal to 320. Then from this place, we can now write the formula connecting them together. What is the formula? Z equal to 320 over what? Over y squared. So from this, we can see that Z is the subject of the formula. I want us to quickly go over all that you have done. We, the topic is joint. And joint variation involves three or more variables. And this variable can be what? Can be direct, inverse, or both. And I want you to know one thing. That when you look at the, these variables, they have something in common. What is that? That is a constant k. And to me, that constant a represents what? Love. And our God is what? He is love. And I want you to reciprocate the same. To everybody around you, show love to them. Before, because the more you love your neighbor, the more God will love you. And before I go, I will give you this assignment. And the assignment is already on the screen. So till I come your way next time, remain blessed and play safe. God bless you. Good day, students. You're welcome to the English language class. My name is Itila Yoaro Woshegbe. In today's lesson, we're studying clauses. Clauses. The last time we met, I gave you some assignments where you are expected to identify which part of some sentences is a phrase. So let's take a review of those exercise. The first sentence says, I live at the end of the street. The first part of the sentence is, I live. The second is, at the end of the street. The correct answer is, at the end of the street. Because in that part of the sentence, there is no finite verb. As a matter of fact, there is no verb at all. 
The second sentence says, the guests walking in with the chairman are to be served first. The guests walking in with the chairman is the first part of the sentence. And the second part says, are to be served first. It is the first part of a sentence that is a phrase because it doesn't have a finite verb. The verb there that looks like a, a verb, the word there that looks like a verb is the word walking, and it is not a finite verb. It is a continuous form of the verb. So the guest walking in with the chairman is the phrase. Sentence three. Meet Susan, my friend and confidant. Meet Susan is the first part. The second part is my friend and confidant. My friend and confidant is a phrase because it does not have a finite verb. In fact, it does not have any verb at all. Sentence four. The overall best student award in English goes to Ikechuku. The first part of the sentence is the overall best student award in English. And the second part says goes to Ikechuku. The first part is a phrase because it does not have any verb at all. Sentence five. He did not state the specific reason for his late coming. The first part says he did not state. The second part of a sentence is the specific reason for his late coming. The phrase there is the second part of a sentence which says the specific reason for his late coming because it does not have any verb in its basic, s, or past form. The only verb there is the word coming. It is not a finite verb. So the specific reason for his late coming is the phrase. Now to today's topic, clauses. Clause is just on the flip side of a phrase. Remember, a phrase is a group of words without a finite verb or without any verb at all. Clauses, on the other hand, is a group of words that has a finite verb. And also, you should recall that a finite verb is a verb in its basic form, S form, or past form. A clause is a group of words with a finite verb. In other words, for a group of words to be qualified to be called a clause, it must have a verb that is either in its basic form, in its S form, or past form. Remember that a finite verb is a verb in its basic form, S form, or past form. Also remember that English lexical verbs have six forms. The first three forms, the basic S and past form, make the final verb. And the last three forms, the participial, the continuous form, and the total infinitive form make up the non-finite forms. Let's consider this table because I, I, I see the need for us to really dwell a little on the participial form. How exactly do you tell how to form a participial form of a verb? Just ask yourself, which form of the verb can I easily use with either has, have, or had? For instance, the verb sing. Which form of the verb sing can I use have or had with easily? That is the word song. E.g., I have sung the baby to sleep. Let's pick the word write. What is the form of the verb write that I can easily use with have? That is written. I have written. Whatever I have written, I have written. So that is how to form the participial form of a verb. Now, note that the verb be has nine forms, as you can see on the table. The verb have, the S form of the verb have is has, the past form of the verb have is had, and the participial form is also had. So it's possible to have the past form and the participial form of a verb 
spelled exactly the same way. So if you find a group of words that has a verb with a form of the verb that, that is exactly spelled the same way in the past form or participial form, treat it as a clause. The verb have has a past and participial form as had. So if you find a group of words that has had, just treat that group of words as a phrase. That takes us to another concept in English language called regular or irregular verbs. It is important for us to be able to differentiate between regular and irregular verbs so that we'll not get confused when we're trying to identify clauses. Irregular verb is a verb that forms its past and participial form in a regular pattern by adding D or ED to the basic forms. Regular verbs form their past and participial form in a regular pattern by adding D or ED to the basic form. In this table, the past and participial form of the word travel is simply formed by adding ED to the basic form. The word fell is a basic form fell is a simple present tense that means to cut down a tree. The past form and the participial form of fell is simply formed by adding ed to the simple form fell. Ground is another simple form of the verb that means to stop an aircraft from flying or if your parents stop you from joining your friends at play, you have been grounded. So the basic form is ground. To form the past and participial form of ground, simply add ed to ground. The next word is hang. Hang. Actually, we have two types of hang. The first is to sentence somebody to death by law. And the second is to suspend anything, your clothes, on a clothesline, for instance. So when somebody is sentenced to death, the person was hanged. The past and particular form of hang in that context is simply formed by adding ed to the basic form. So it's a regular verb. Let's go to the word lie. Lie means to say something you know is not true. Falsehood. It's a regular verb because to form the past and participial form of lie, you simply add D to the basic form. The next word is die. To form the past and participial form of the word die, die means to change the color of something, your hair, your cloth, with a chemical. So to form the past and participial form of die, simply add D to the word die. So that is about regular verbs. For irregular verbs, on the other hand, they do not have a regular pattern for forming their past and participial form. Irregular verbs do not have a regular pattern for forming their past and participial form. I, like I said before, the verb be has nine forms. The past and participial form, the past form of be are was and were. The participial form of be is been. Please take note. The word do, the past form of the verb do is did, and the participial form is done. Fall, fall, the past form of fall is fell, the past participle form is fallen, so it's an irregular verb. The word grind, to reduce something to a powdery form, grind, the past form is ground, and 
the past participle form is ground. At this juncture, I think I need to remind you that don't join the people that say grinded pepper. Grinded is not an adjective. It is a past form of grind, the, the regular verb. Okay, so when you reduce something to a powdery form, the past form is ground. The past participial form is ground. Then the hang, that means to suspend a material somewhere, is hung. The past form is hung. The past participial form is hung. Please take note, it's an irregular verb. Then we go to the word lie. Lie, L-I-E, is a verb that means to place yourself on a horizontal position, a, a sleeping position. Okay, the past form is lay, L-A-Y. The past participial form is lain, L-A-I-N. Then another one that looks like it is L-A-Y, lay. Your hen could lay egg. You lay your bed sheet on the bed. You can lay a baby gently on a surface. It's another irregular verb because the past form is laid. The past participial form is laid. Please, you need to master the differences between the regular verbs and the irregular verbs so that when you find them in expressions, you will be able to tell if that form of the verb falls under the finite or the non-finite verbs. If you look at the table on your screen, the words in blue fonts are finite verbs because they are in their basic S or past forms. And the ones in the black font are non-finite verbs because they are in their participial form, ing form, or to form. Okay, let's take a quick recap on what a clause is. It is a group of words with a finite verbs. Let's try our hands on the following examples. In the sentences below, you will tell why the underlined expressions are clauses. Sentence one, the woman told the doctor how she contracted the disease. The underlying expression is how she contracted the disease. How she contracted the disease is a clause. Can you tell why? How she contracted the disease. We call it a clause because it has a finite verb. Can you point out the finite verb in how she contracted the disease? It's because of the word contracted. Contracted is in the past form of the verb contract. Sentence two, the vaccine was discovered after many people have been infected. The vaccine was discovered after many people have been infected. After many people have been infected is a clause. Can you tell why? It has a finite verb. In fact, it has more than a finite verb. After many people have been infected. The first finite verb there is the word have is in the basic form. And the second finite verb there is infected is in the, is in the past form. So after many people have been infected, it's a clause because we can find finite verbs in it. Sentence three, our teacher raised an instant alarm when the class captain sneezed. The underlined part of a sentence is when the class captain sneezed. When the class captain sneezed. Why did we call it a clause? Because we can identify a finite verb in it. When the class captain sneezed. Can you tell the finite verb in when the class captain sneezed? The finite verb there is sneezed. It is a past form of the verb sneeze. The next one says, when I was preparing to go to school, it suddenly began to rain. 
The underlined part of his sentence says, when I was preparing to go to school. It's a clause. It's a clause because it has a finite verb. Can you tell which of the words is a finite verb? Is the verb was. The verb was is a form of be. It is a past form of the verb be. However, take another look at that sentence. It has another verb, but it is not a finite verb. The expression to go is a non-finite verb. If it is only to go that we have in that expression, it will be a phrase. But now that we have was there, then it's a clause. When I was preparing to go to school is a clause. It has a finite verb. It has a non-finite verb, so it's a clause. In as much as we can identify a finite verb in it. The next one says, the chairman arrived after the meeting had begun. The underlying part of a sentence is, after the meeting had begun. It's a clause. Can you identify the finite verb in it? The verb had. Had is a past form of have. So, after the meeting had begun, is a clause. Let's have an evaluation to test if you really have comprehended what a clause is. For the next set of sentences, I divided it, each sentence into two parts. They're going to tell which part of a sentence is the clause. The first one says, he gave me a pack of nose masks. The first part says, he gave me. The second part says, a pack of nose masks. Which of these two parts is a clause? Is the first part of a sentence, he gave me. Why? Because he gave me has a finite verb in it. And the finite verb is the verb gave. Gave is a past form of give. The next one says, not long after the WHO official report, Newspaper reporters had a field day speculating on the spike in coronavirus cases. This sentence is divided into not long after the WHO's, WHO's official report, which is the first part, and the second part says newspaper reporters had a field day speculating on the spike in coronavirus cases. Which of these two parts of a sentence is a clause? I hope you went for the second part because that is a clause. Newspaper reporters had a field day speculating on the spike in coronavirus cases is a clause because it is a part of a sentence that has a finite verb. And the finite verb is the word had, is a past form of have. The next one says, the student's mild clapping suggests they are not happy with the principal's decision. The first part of the sentence says, the student's mouth clapping, and the second part says, suggest they are not happy with the principal's decision. So which part of the sentence is a clause? I hope you went for the second part, because that is the part where we have the final verb in the sentence. And what is the final verb in suggest they are not happy with the principal's decision? Is a verb suggest. Is it S form of suggest? Always remember, a phrase does not have a finite verb. A clause has a finite verb. The finite verb is a verb in its basic form, S form, or past form. We're going to try out identifying phrases and clauses in some sentences, that's your assignment. You will tell which of the underlined expressions in the sentences is a phrase or a clause. The first sentence says, I simply could not take the crucial step because my bond with school had become very firm. The underlined expression is because my bond with school had become very firm. You tell 
Is it a phrase or a clause? The second sentence says, everybody was impressed with the feats which went along with the hilarious drumming. The underlying part of the sentence says, which went along with the hilarious drumming. State whether it's a phrase or a clause. Sentence three, my cousin ran like the wind. The underlined expression is like the wind. Tell us, is it a phrase or a clause? Like the wind, a phrase or a clause? Does it have a final verb? Does it not? Sentence four, the students wandered into the heart of the forest. The students wandered into the heart of the forest. The underlined expression is into the heart of the forest. Tell us, is into the heart of the forest a phrase or a clause? Then lastly, his captors muttered words that sounded like the muttering of a colony of baboons. The underlined expression is like the muttering of a colony of baboons. Tell us if it's a phrase or a clause. God bless you. Stay safe.